Okay, we are live, baby, but we got to let it breathe. Hang tight. Bring on our Facebook crew here. Get things fired off proper. A momentous day as it relates to your Denver Broncos. Welcome in, everybody. It is the Mile High Huddle Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, my fellow football priest, you know him, you love him, Zach Kelberman. Zach, I don't know, two hours or so before we went live here, the the denizens of Broncos country had, for many of them anyway, a nuclear bomb dropped on them. A nuclear bomb of disappointment, Zach, when Jim Harbaugh officially removed his name from contention on any NFL head coaching job, but specifically, obviously, as it applies to what we're talking about, the Broncos, what was your gut reaction? And tell people, actually, let's just start with your gut reaction to the news. Well, I would say half of Broncos country had a bomb dropped on them because half of Broncos country wanted Harbaugh. The other half uh, wants Sean Payton. And that other half certainly wants him more now that he's the far and away the 1A and there's no one really um, comparable to him with Harbaugh out. So my gut was the Broncos were used. They were uh, taken advantage of and manipulated by Jim Harbaugh, who whatever he squeezed out of Michigan, it had to have been worth it. I read that he wasn't even signing a new deal. He might in the future, but if this didn't come down to immediate money, I don't know what the flirtation was about, but in hindsight, we should have been more uh, clued in and it should have been more of a red flag that Harbaugh did not meet with the Broncos in person. It was a two hour zoom interview. It Mm. couldn't have been all that serious, Chad. And looking back on it, I guess it wasn't. This is why when people would ask me, I even had a Michigan beat writer reach out to me, dude, which way is this going to go? Is it going to be Harbaugh? I'm like, dude, you never know when it comes to the NFL hiring free agent signings, things like that. And even on draft day, beware of making too many bold predictions because the uh, ground shifts beneath your feet without warning. And people know that was my Jim Harbaugh was my one. A. I thought he would have been the best fit. Obviously, he either wasn't that into it or something ulterior was going on as that kind of hinted at that he was leveraging the. uh the Wolverines by talking to the Broncos to try and get something more out of it. Either way, it doesn't matter. He's off the board. So now, Zach, it all comes down to if we're still looking at the 1A and the 1B, 1A is gone, moving into 1A from 1B, Sean Payton. Is this now, Zach, Tuesday? I mean, obviously, Payton was smiling uh, big time. Hashtag leverage if you're Sean Payton when he read the news today uh, about Jim Harbaugh. But does this mean Greg Penner's going into that hell or high water close the deal, whatever it takes. Cause you also had a report earlier today. You should tell everybody about where we got a little bit of detail now on what the ask is from the new Orleans saints on the trade itself for his rights. Yeah, it, it was stronger than a report. This was straight from the horse's mouth. Sean Payton, who's talked with the saints GM, Mickey Loomis about compensation. And he said, ultimately and it can change by the team, but when it comes down to it, the saints are going to want a mid to later round first round pick. And he made the comments on Colin Coward's show, and Colin Coward was quick to point out, oh, the Broncos don't have a first-round pick. Well, Sean Payton himself corrected Colin Coward and said, well, they got one from the Dolphins for Bradley Chubb. Um, So that's the deal. They want what the Broncos have. They can offer that, Chad. They can write Sean Payton a blank check. It comes down to, does he value that job and the opportunity to work with Russell Wilson more than, let's say, Arizona or Carolina or Houston, who surprisingly he said he was absolutely considering. He talked about their draft capital. He talked about their the potential they have on their roster, but not much more than that. It struck me as a coach who – maybe considering Denver and is now leveraging other yes. teams to get more yes. out of Denver as well. He should. I mean, that's what I would be doing. David McElrath. What's up, brother? Thanks for getting in early with a super chat. Big dog. He says, good evening. I'm really bummed about Harbaugh. I guess I'm in on the Sean Payton train. MHS for live Denver Broncos for life. Hey, word right back at you. I was, uh, I'm not going to lie. I felt a pang of disappointment when, when Nick Kendall called me because I was actually away from, from my, uh, MHH cockpit, so to speak. He's like, dude, Harbaugh, Stan. I'm like, ooh, really? He's like, yeah. And I felt that pang just like you guys because I thought he would have been a nice fit, but so would Sean Payton. Sean Payton, golly, the things the Broncos could do with him at the helm and what could be done to turn the ship around with Russ and just overall get this team trending in the right direction. The good news is, gang, that's still on the table. All right. They meet tomorrow in person. So, Zach, you and I, we were quizzical, right? We're like, 
hmm, what are the implications of this being a virtual interview with Jim Harbaugh? And so many people, I, I thought it was interesting now, especially even more so, Zach, in hindsight, so many people in our, uh, we'll call it the Broncos blogosphere, all right, people who cover the Broncos and media, they were very dismissive of the notion that there was any meaning whatsoever in the fact that it was a virtual only. I don't know exactly what, but it shows at the very least on a on one party side a semi lack of commitment. Like if you're Jim Harbaugh, I'll do a virtual interview. I don't want to take the time to fly to you or you all the the hoopla of you coming here. Let's just do it virtual. There's something to that, I think. Now, exactly what? Hard to say, but I think it at least speaks to the overall commitment in that individual's interest in the opportunity. Yeah, and in hindsight, I wouldn't want a coach who leverages other teams to get more money. Obviously, his heart is in his wallet, and that's not where I want my head coach's heart to be. The next point I wanted to make, though, is something that Michaela brought up. I want to address it really quickly. Thank you so much, Michaela, for the super. Uh, she asked, are the Broncos the only team with an in-person meeting with Pete? And I heard that today. Other teams have permission but not scheduled. What I wanted to say about Houston, Adam Schefter reported before tonight's game, and by the way, Dan Quinn's Cowboys are playing Tom Brady and the Bucks. I would keep an eye on that game. But he reported that Sean Payton actually met tonight with the Houston Texans to conduct their interview. The Broncos will not be the first team that meets with Sean Payton. And Payton himself said later this week he will meet in person with David Tepper, the Panthers owner in New York. So the Broncos are number two on the list for Sean Payton in terms of interview process. That is interesting because – I think in these situations where it's the top candidate, whether it's a free agent or a coach, oftentimes, Zach, if you look back through the lens of history, the team that got there first, oftentimes, not always, it's not an absolute, there are no absolutes or very few in football, team that gets there first has the best chance. Now, one of the exceptions to that rule were the Peyton Manning sweepstakes and et cetera. So it's, it's not, again, an absolute, but what that tells me is Houston – making a push to get their foot in the door before the Denver Broncos, that's a meaningful maneuver. And it'll be interesting to see because if I'm that team, um, you know, Peyton might be, ha he might have some kind of a basis of here's what I'm going to ask for Broncos. If you want to meet, at least I know this is a starting point you're open to. So he can leverage that back and forth. But if I'm Houston, man, and that's my guy and I get to talk to him first, it's blank check time, dude. It's, hey, whatever it takes, you tell me. So it'll be interesting to see what comes of that, whether it's word tonight or hopefully, fingers crossed, he holds to his, his commitment and ends up meeting with the Broncos tomorrow. Yeah, I think he will. I mean, the Broncos have two interviews scheduled for tomorrow. After they talk to Peyton, they're going to talk to Raheem Morris, the uh, Rams defensive coordinator. I don't see it with him. I'm right there mm -hmm. with you, Chad. Um if we can queue up the interview that he had on Colin Coward show, that'd be great. I don't know about any sort of copyright, but if you listen to Sean Payton, it is copyrighted, by the way, we can't do it. They'll, they'll, they'll ding us. I think that sucks because if you listen to Peyton's response, he was asked specifically about the Texans. He didn't talk specifically about the Broncos, save for mentioning their first round pick. But, you know, he, he mentioned the draft capital. He mentioned the potential, but he stopped and stuttered and he didn't really have a co coherent thought as to why he should go to the Texans. It didn't seem like they were atop his list. Again, it struck me as a coach who knows where he wants to go. And now he's pulling the Harbaugh where he's trying to maximize the contract or whatever else from that destination. Guys, we would show you that. But what happens is uh, because we don't own that, it's copyrighted, if it, and especially if it was broadcast on television. We've had to learn this the hard way, that if it's on TV or if it's copyrighted at all, and then we just stream it to show you guys, uh, they ding our channel for copyright infringement. Unfortunately, Sam Bam, bro, much love and respect. Thank you for the super. He says, good evening with Harbaugh off the list. I guess Sean Payton is plan B if he wasn't already planning. If the Broncos don't get Payton, do you think Dan Quinn is plan c caldwell maybe plan d go broncos yeah what what's your gut read now that one the picture has crystallized a little bit right things are coalescing we're starting to get some clarity harbaugh's off the board how do you perceive the broncos in terms of their order of preference here obviously it's probably a sean payton or bust type scenario but they have to be prepared for a contingency yeah, uh, Mike Kliss reported earlier that the Broncos and Jim Harbaugh never even got close to contract discussions. So I'm not totally sure that Harbaugh was the Broncos' plan A to begin with. It might have been Sean Payton all along. 
In that case, presupposing that, I think Dan Quinn, considering the relationship to Russell Wilson and George Payton, would be plan B. Plan C is interchangeable. It's a toss-up to me. It can be David Shaw, who I think is plan C. There's a reason, Chad, why they interviewed him beyond just Jim Harbaugh. There's also Jim Caldwell, who I would not like. And the first-time option in a sort of D'Amico Ryans that they're going to talk to on Thursday, I believe. But if I had to give you my plan A and plan B right now with Harbaugh off the board, it's Sean Payton or Dan Quinn. I absolutely love how D'Amico Ryan's unit plays for him. And that intensity, man, yeah. it trickles through every facet of that Niners team. There's, I don't know, like my, my head tells me if it's not Peyton, go with a retread with some, at least some modicum of skin on the wall in form of a Dan Quinn. Intensity, high culture guy. At the same time, a, a good player's coach, but he can walk that line, you know, as far as being an authority figure and being their friend. If you can't get him, man, my head says Dallas Cowboys defensive coordinator. My heart says D'Amico Ryans. That's only if we're talking about consolations here and the Sean Payton things off the off the table. Mike, bro, appreciate you throwing down some stars. Thank you, buddies. Good to see you. Hope you're doing well. A Mount Rushmore figure. Uh, Scott says get D'Amico Ryans and pair him with a retread uh, as a an assistant head coach. Interesting. Howie freaking day in the freaking house. What's up, brother? It's great to see you. Uh, we want to hear how you guys are feeling, though. Let us let us know what you feel, uh, what what your gut reaction is to this news. Naj jumping in. What's up, brother? Happy New Year. Right to you. Right back at you, big dog. He says, I don't want anyone who doesn't want to be here. We need someone who is all in. I never expected Harbaugh or Peyton. I think Jim Caldwell is the guy, and I would keep out and I don't know. I wouldn't be up here if if the Broncos ultimately end up hiring Jim Caldwell. I'm not going to completely pan the move because I'm sitting here saying, let's get some experience. Let's get a, a retread. Let's get a guy with some competency. Hashtag extreme competency. And although he's a very milk toast kind of energy dude, he is a competent head coach. All right. Led the, the Colts in the late stage of the Peyton Manning era, right, to a Super Bowl berth. Couldn't quite get over the hump against Sean Payton. And then he went to Detroit and had a couple of impressive seasons before ultimately flaming out. So it wouldn't be the worst possible thing, Zach, but it's certainly not something that is going to excite anybody. <laughs> I'm not, I don't want to come across like a Jim Caldwell hater. I understand how respected he is around the NFL and all that he's accomplished, but I feel like on those old Colts teams, Chad, you could have put Theo Jensen at head coach and they would have thrived. I mean, Peyton Manning was the GM, the head coach, the quarterback. He was the star of those teams. Naj, I love you, man, but I have to disagree. It'd be an extremely hard sell to go from Ferrari shopping to Toyota shopping. That's what you do with Jim Caldwell. Then you retain Justin Outen. Uh, it's too much of the old. It's not sexy enough for what the fans want. I understand Sean Payton is the big swing here, but even like Scott mentioned, D'Amico Ryans, let's say, paired with David Shaw, the, the experienced guy, I guess you can call him a retread. He can be the OC. I'd rather take a gamble on a fourth first-timer than go for someone like Jim Caldwell. That's, that's my personal preference. Phil jumping in to say, and thank you, Phil. Love you, big dog. He says, so... Aaron Rodgers off the table. Tomorrow we sign Russell Wilson. And then, of course, putting that in parentheses to the current uh, situation is with Sean Payton. LOL, he says, MHH for life. So, yeah, in the same sense that Broncos fans were disappointed when the news broke, Zach, that Aaron Rodgers was going to stay with Green Bay, only to, been, to then be elated by the blockbuster Russell Wilson trade. Perhaps that's what's in store, maybe, this week, is, hey, Jim Harbaugh's off the table, but guess what? Consolation, you get Sean Payton. Let's just hope, Zach, that if it does shake out that way, you get a better result in year one than you did with the Russell Wilson trade. And then we'll grab Deanna. It's so funny, Phil, that you mentioned that because that's the thought I had earlier. I swear to God, I was still tweeting about the Sean Payton interview with Colin Coward. Then the news comes out that Jim Harbaugh is staying at Michigan. It struck me a lot as that Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, you know, scenario. But hopefully the Broncos end up with a better version of Russell Wilson as a head coach and the quarterback they landed last year lady d says uh i'm bummed on harbaugh yeah she was big on you were big on on harbaugh she says i just don't see sean payton coming to the broncos hopefully he does but it's a stretch I'm gonna take top dollar to land him for sure well you guys are awesome thank you deanna mhh for life right back at you mount rushmore superstar um you know 
back to what you were saying, Zach, with Sean Payton's appearance on the Colin Cowherd show, when it came time to talk about Houston, you know, the one missing ingredient here for if you're Sean Payton and you're, let's just say for a minute, all things being equal, these are all billionaire owners. Let's just say money's not a problem. Whatever his ask is, it's not a problem for any of these guys. All right. Let's just assume that for a second. You look at Houston, no quarterback, no bona fide guy. Um, you look at Denver, hey, Russell Wilson, going to need some uh, CPR perhaps. You know, we got to resuscitate this dude, bring him back to life. But Peyton's no stranger to that because even though Drew Brees in his final year in San Diego, Zach, he didn't exactly flame out, but he had a solid final season, 2005. It wasn't great, but it was solid. Then he suffers in the season finale, that that career-threatening injury that many in the NFL thought he was done. Like, that's it. Sean Payton, though, Zach, did not blink, came down to two teams. I, I've read the Drew Brees biography, all right? I know exactly how it went down. Came down to two teams. Miami was interested, brought him in for a sniff, gave him all these assurances, and then on his way to talk to Sean Payton, he learns they're going to sign Dante Culpepper instead. So now he's talking to Sean Payton. Sean Payton wasn't worried at all about what investment it would take from a coaching perspective to figure out that shoulder and get him on a level that – because this was a guy by that point in his career, not the breeze he became yet, but he had been to a Pro Bowl. This was a guy that had some skins on the wall as a as an NFL quarterback, and Sean Payton looked past the drawbacks, Zach. He looked past some of the downside risk that terrified all the other teams and scared them away, went all in on Drew Brees. The rest is history. So I can see similar parallels with how he might be viewing the Russell Wilson situation, whereas – in Houston, there's nothing really there for him, in my opinion, to sink his teeth into. There's a top draft pick that he can use to draft his own quarterback. That's always enticing for an offensive-minded coach. But Well, uh, unless it goes to the Saints, right? True, yeah. I, I think they have two first-rounders, though. So even if they trade one to New Orleans, they – they do. So yeah, they'd have another one, but it's still the franchise that's considered a basement dweller. It's like, do you want to come out of your mini retirement and you're Sean Payton? You have all this name cachet and you're going to go with uh, a team that not long ago was an expansion franchise. They don't have the history of the Broncos. They don't have the legacy of the Broncos. I don't know how much that means to him, but he brought up two things today in his interview that were critical to him. That's his word, critical quarterback. And he already has intimated and reporting has claimed that he'd have no problem working with Russell Wilson. He would take on the opportunity. He also mentioned ownership. And reportedly, he prefers the Broncos' stable ownership. I don't know how stable it could be, you know, six months in, but I interpret that with a dollar sign on the S. And uh, just to give you a word of fact about the Broncos' ownership, they can buy the Panthers and the Texans combined. Those are the two competitors for his services seven times over. So if he's looking for the dollar bill, if he's looking to be financially compensated, there is no, exactly, there you go, hashtag <laughs> staple. There is no other uh, team that can come close to what the Broncos can offer, and that's just in the checkbook. I agree, and that's why I'm saying, like, even if you assume everyone could match whatever offer the Broncos might be willing to to you know the heights they might be willing to go to land Sean Payton there are a lot of other pluses in that column that if I'm Sean Payton I'm looking harder at the Broncos storied franchise one of the winnings uh winningest of all time three Lombardis in the case of uh, 15 I'm trying to remember now if the Chiefs have caught up I don't think so they're dang close but 15 division titles all time which is most in the AFC West Chiefs are closing in on them though because these last seven years man it's been brutal that they've they've covered some ground in terms of catching up to the Broncos in that respect. But you look at the quarterback, Zach, you look at the names that ha are on injured reserve that were not really available to the Broncos, that if you're Sean Payton, you can picture being available to you next year, especially if you make some good decisions on your strength and conditioning side of things and get that right. There's a lot to be excited. Plus still the distinct possibility of having a zero ever return as the defensive coordinator there is a lot to be attracted to, and that's removing the money and removing the owners, which ends up, of course, being the cherry on top. And Scott saying, we can talk Drew Brees, but Sean Payton had a 17-5 and record with the collection of quarterbacks Taysom Hill, Teddy Bridgewater, and Jameis Winston as starters. So fair, fair point. Jameis Winston looked night and day better when he got in Sean Payton's clutches. And I realized that Winston was still erratic, 
he was still prone to the interception, but he never threw the ball better than when he was under Sean Payton. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, if it, it let's take money off the table when it comes to Payton. It comes down to personal preference. Where do you want to go? Carolina. That's who I feel is the main competition for Payton as it stands right now. And if you're Sean Payton, do you go take on a job where you'd be facing your former team twice a year, same mm. division. I understand there's some motivation to that, but it can work the other way as well. He's still beloved in New Orleans. He has a very tight relationship with Mickey Loomis, the GM there. Does he want to stay in that division and face his former team twice? I don't know. And will the Saints kowtow to the notion of having to compete against sure. Sean Payton twice a year? Mike, dude, throwing down some big baller stars. Thank you, brother. Really appreciate you. Mount Rushmore supporter and superstar. You demand, brother. That's the thing is, you know, you, you, we look back on, and even Sean Payton himself has referenced these precedents. You look back on the Bill Belichick trade, all right, going from an AFC East team, New York Jets, to New England Patriots, and then the same thing with Parcells in division. That was 25-plus years ago, all right? Times have changed. It's pretty rare that you see in-division trades of any sort because teams are just reluctant to um, – do anything that might give a, a rival an upper hand in any which way. I mean, even John Gruden, Zach, dealt to the opposite coast, right? Dealt to the NFC South from the Raiders back, what, whatever that was, 2002, 2003. But George Fox, brother, thank you, buddy. He says, my call is the Eagles offensive coordinator, Shane Steichen, or anyone other than Sean Payton. So are you saying give me anyone other than Sean Payton or if you don't get Sean Payton, give me the Eagles OC? Just curious uh, for clarity there. Zach, what are your thoughts, though, on the Eagles offensive coordinator? Because that, that scheme, man, has looked next level in the regular season. We'll see how it shakes out in the playoffs, but it's been impressive. I took that to mean as well that if the Broncos don't get Payton, then Shane Steichen would be the plan B. Unfortunately, who the Broncos have interviewed is who they're going to choose from. The The door is closed, so to speak. Uh, they have their candidates, and Shane Steichen is not among them, at least that we know. Again, first-timer, do you gamble on that? Do you take another chance? They've been burned three times in a row. That's why they're going to go after an experienced guy. A lot to like about Steichen, but then you wonder. Nick Sirianni's there. He's helped mold the offense, obviously. And it's easy to win when you have a quarterback like Jalen Hurts. You have A.J. Brown, Miles Sanders, Devontae Smith. A lot of talent on that team, though not to take anything away from Steichen, who's doing a hell of a job there. George clarifies for us, yeah, that's if we don't get Peyton. Got you. Yeah, that's the that's the interesting factor here, guys. Zach brings up a very salient point here, and that is we can have uh, candidates that we point out to our heart's content, but if they're not, if there's been no reporting of the Broncos reaching out to request an interview or reports of an interview taking place, because with David Shaw, that one just came out of the blue. Hey, they're interviewing him today. It's over. And you're like, whoa. Uh, that could happen again. There could be other coaches, I suppose, that could be suddenly come out of the blue. And even Jim Caldwell, that was like, wait, what? That could happen. But now as we're stretching, Zach, into the second week post-Black Monday of the head coaching search, there's a, you know, these guys are starting to get a little pit in their stomach of got to get this solved. You know, that once the first domino drops, man, teams are going to start making exceptions. They're going to start just going, all right, let's get our, let's get a guy that we like and, so I think Sean Payton, I mean, we, you could view Zach, I guess, Jim Harbaugh as kind of the first domino to fall in terms of shaping this head coaching hiring cycle. But when it comes to hires, something about, I think it's whatever happens with Sean Payton, wherever he lands, that's going to create the domino effect and things will quite quickly probably fall into place. So as Broncos fans, what we're getting at here is start kind of, acclimating yourselves to the idea of one of the names you know the Broncos have expressed an interest in becoming this team's head coach. Could be Sean Payton. Could be Raheem Morris. Inoculate yourselves for that possibility. Yeah, we have Nas jumping back in, 1999 Super. Thank you, thank you so much, Nas. Always good to see you in the chat. He says, Russ had a terrible year, but eight TDs, first 11 games, eight the last four plus two rushing. Something clicked with Judy. This is by far the best coach opening, in my opinion. Getting Shaw would be great, or Ryan's or Quinn. Hate giving up a first. Mm -hmm. I do too, but – and I'm the biggest proponent for using all the draft capital the Broncos have on the offensive line. I don't want to come off like a hypocrite, but when you boil it down, you're pretty much trading Bradley Chubb for Sean Payton. 
And raise your hand if you make that trade. I'm raising mine. I, I know it's not a one for one like that, but it's a it's going to be like a number 30, 31, 32 overall pick. And you have a chance to get one of the best head coaches of this generation and pair him with another diminutive quarterback like he experienced with Drew Brees. So I, I understand the draft pick compensation, but the the competency, your word, Chad, the talent, the ability, and the command and presence that Sean Payton has, I think makes that deal worthwhile. Yeah, and that's the other interesting thing And when we're looking at parallels here as far as where Sean Payton could land, the fact that it is a, a shorter quarterback. I mean, Drew Brees was six foot tall, basically standing on his tippy toes. I'm exaggerating a little, but six feet. Russ, 5'11". So he's even an inch shorter than Breeze was. Look, you, maybe there are football guys that would argue till the cows come home that how much of a difference every millimeter within that inch makes. But I think it's when you're talking about size and relative to what we know Sean Payton is able to do as far as overcoming that, if you want to consider it a drawback or a weakness, Russell Wilson, man, I would love to see him getting coached by – Sean Payton. It's also worth noting here, guys. Russ knew Jim Harbaugh from competing against him in the NFC West for his first three, four years, two, three years, whatever it was. Uh, but to my knowledge, he was never coached by Jim Harbaugh. In the case of Sean Payton, when Russ was asked about the coaching candidates on sun last Sunday following the season finale, he gushed, he waxed poetic, Zach, talking about Sean Payton because of the time he spent in his exposure, not just competing with the Saints in the conference, but being coached by him at the Pro Bowl. So Russ loves him. We know at the very least Sean Payton is more than familiar with, you know, in the sense when you when you bring up Russell Wilson, for a guy like Payton, Zach, it's more than just knowing who he is and competing against him and watching the film. Like, he's had interpersonal, you know, it is the Pro Bowl. The stakes are much less. It's, a, it's not a huge emphasis as far as practice, but – Still, he's been around him in those rooms, so he has a pretty good bead on what kind of what it would be like, I guess, to coach Russell Wilson, and that is important. Yeah, I mean, I'm of the mind the Broncos should be going all in on Sean Payton now. I know it's not their building, but they need to let him not leave tomorrow's interview without an offer in hand, an agreement in place. If it takes a first-round pick, it takes the first-round pick. you got to have the coaching in place before you attack any other area of the team. We have... Questions coming in about the trade. Would it be a Pat Sertan instead of a draft pick? No, the Broncos cannot trade players for coaches as part of that deal. It would be a combination of draft picks and cash or just a draft pick to get that deal done. And again, this ownership group has the cheddar to say, hey, look, we'll give you our first round pick, but no more. And here's a X millions of dollars for the rights as well on top of that for Sean Payton. And there's also the element I brought it up a few times. I think when the chips are down, I'll just put it this way. I have my doubts how much this ultimately means to the Saints ownership and front office. But if Sean Payton, remember what you said uh, he mentioned in this conversation with uh, Colin Cowherd that depends on the team, right? What the ask is going to be. Why would it depend on the team? I'll tell you why. Because it will be a combination of how hard he is actually squeezing his former team to make it happen. And then if they're like, all right, this is our this is the place he wants to go. Let's make the most out of it. What do they have? You know, what makes sense? What could they part with? You know, da, da, da. Then all of a sudden, you know, const, uh, they're making exceptions potentially, right? They're instead of saying, we want your first round pick, we want your second round pick, we want that. They're going, all right, he really wants to go there. We'll do right by him. He's the only guy to bring a winning product basically to our football team ever. Plus, he's brought home a world championship. Let's do right by him. And we're not going to get fleeced, but give us that first round pick, X amount of millions of dollars. He's yours. Yeah. How I read into his comments were Mickey Loomis. He knows that Mickey Loomis has to save face in a trade. He has to get what's his out of this deal and do what's right by new Orleans. But I feel like considering their close personal friendship, they wouldn't, you know, rake someone, a team over the coals to get Sean Payton's rights. And don't forget they can trade future draft picks as well. I'm not saying two firsts, a first year, a first this year and a first next year, but maybe 
maybe a third this year and a third next year, a third this year and a second next year. I don't know, but it's not going to be as dire, I believe, as most were making it out to be. You know, two first rounders and two second rounders. It's going to be a little cheaper than that. We'll see how far the Broncos want to go, though. And it's worth noting that Peyton, if if the Saints don't try to play some ball here, they do risk getting nothing for him. If he sits out this season right. and next season, then his rights are relinquished. He's a free agent. He can go anywhere. Saints have no way to get a return on that. So, you know, there's there's some leverage there, right, that Sean Payton could utilize. Mike, jumping in again. Thank you, brother. He says, I want a coach that cares about the Broncos organization with the passionate fans that come to Empower Field at Mile High no matter what happens. Uh, win or lose, go Broncos. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, you, you shall know them by their fruits. What do we know about Sean Payton's track record? You know, he brought a winning program that he was able to sustain, took a guy that was a fringe pro bowler kind of guy, then he becomes a Hall of Famer. That's a guy that cares about the team he's he's coaching for. It's not just, let me collect my millions. Like, this is a guy that's invested. And I do believe, Zach, that, you know, a, a, a portion of the motivations, on some level anyway, the reason he stepped down in New Orleans was there's a good chance he just couldn't give it. He was burnt out. He needed a break. He needed a little breather. Now he's re-energized. Etc. I don't understand the, the the two arguments against Sean Payton. Uh, the fact that he supposedly quit on the Saints. He was with them for 16 years. After nearly two decades, doesn't he get the right to walk away if he wants to? Chad, take some time away. He brought the city a Super Bowl. He saved them after Katrina. I I mean, he did a lot for that city, a lot for that franchise. I don't understand why his reputation is tattered over that. And also Bounty Gate. People call him a rat and a scoundrel. It was 10 years ago in a different NFL city. Is it really that important? Are you going to hold that higher than what Sean Payton can do? Does that one incident supersede what he can bring to the Broncos as an, a wonderful offensive mind? To me, it doesn't. It reminds me of all the character concerns around someone like Micah Parsons coming out a few years ago. And look at Parsons now. You have to kind of take the gamble sometimes and overlook an intangible quality, yeah. so to speak. Well, and it also speaks to just, look, we don't necessarily need to get into Bounty Gate. All right. I think most people know the ins and outs of that. But it also speaks to just how, what length this dude is willing to go to win football games. Like, even though that was more the brainchild of Greg Williams, okay, the defensive coordinator at the time. Obviously, Peyton sanctioned it, signed off on it. Uh, as the head coach, and even if he was perfectly oblivious, which we know he wasn't, but even if he was, by default, look, you're responsible. You were the head coach. But uh, I really don't want to go too far down into the Bounty Gate thing because it is such ancient history. We're talking about uh, accusations and things that occurred leading up to and in the 2009 season. George Fox, brother, he says, to me, the difference between Russ and Drew Brees is – what's between the years, and I don't see it in Rust, at least the way he played this year. MHH for life. Thank you, bro. Well, look, this year I understand that that could color the, 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 the picture here as far as how you view Rust, but did you feel that way when he was in Seattle? Because I tell you what, Zach, anytime I watched a Seahawks game or anytime I watched the Broncos go up against him, it seemed like a damn savvy quarterback to me in terms of smart – you know, knowing how the bread was buttered, manipulating the defense, stingy with the ball in terms of not giving it away, and just refused to flat out lose games. Like just a stubborn unwillingness to give up the ghost. And so why did that change when he came to Denver? I think a big part of it, guys, we got to remember with Russ is he wanted – he was looking for a situation where he could have more freedom to become what he – perceived as a pocket passer right and he felt like he wasn't able to be given that freedom that rope by Pete Carroll and company up in Seattle and the Broncos with a young inexperienced kind of naive incompetent head coach were dumb enough to say yeah and kind of fed into that and combined with the fact that the coaching staff was so inexperienced and incompetent it just jumped the shark early and just you never really got it back as long as as uh, Hackett was there. And so that's why I it's an outlier season, George, is what I'm getting at. I read more into the 10 years of his NFL resume than I do the one in Denver. And I get it. It is a Zach. It's a what have you done for me lately league. 
There's recency bias, all that stuff. That's what's fresh on everyone's brain right now is the 2022 version of Russ. But a guy like Sean Payton, that's not how he's viewing this. It's part of the calculus. It's, you know, it's a factor, but it's not the end all be all. Well, what has run does Russ done lately? And that's put his best football on tape over the past year. I know it's not saying much, but look at the numbers. You know, he had 12 uh, touchdowns and nine picks uh, with Hackett. He had six touchdowns and two picks without Hackett. Um, he ended the year on a stronger note because the head coach and the chief play caller at the time was the major problem. When they went to Jerry Rossberg and especially Justin Allen, Russ looked like a different quarterback entirely, not just with his arm, with his legs as well. He was playing freer, more confident, more inspired. So that's the thing with Russ is I don't think we're ever going to see a quarterback that played as well as he did in his prime, but we're not going to see the same quarterback that played as bad as he did to start the year this past season with a good coach like Sean Payton, you can get him somewhere in the middle. And if you have a top 15 quarterback paired with that top 10 defense, you're going to win games and maybe even playoff games. I mean, look at it like this. If a guy who was never sniffed as a head coach, by the way, Phil, thank you, brother. I'm going to grab you one second. If a guy who was never sniffed as a head coach candidate chilling in retirement by the name of Jerry Rossberg can come in and in two weeks, uh, completely alter the complexion of this team intensity competency attention to detail uh physicality all that stuff all right this is a guy that is not ever going to be compared to a sean payton then imagine gang what a sean payton could do to influence this thing it it's one of those sayings zach coined it coaching 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 here on this podcast it makes all the difference phil wants to know though zach anybody not taking exactly um, as would anybody not take bill belichick because of Spygate or even uh, Deflategate, etc. The different scandals that have happened. I don't think anyone's really batting an eye at that. Again, I hate it. You know, cheaters never prosper. That whole thing that you were talking. But it shows you the level of crazy commitment these guys will go to and what they'll risk to come out on top and be the winner. I, I, not to take a shot at anyone specifically, but if you're of the mind where you're going to pass on Sean Payton because you think it might happen again, bounty gate, you know, that's a very cowardly way of going about business. It's not going to happen again. It was a one time unprecedented sort of um, uh, antics going on. And you don't have a Greg Williams on staff. If you keep a zero ever, he's pretty much the anti Greg Williams. So again, it was, you said 2009, it was even further than I remember it being. It's more than a decade. It's going on 15 years. It's yeah. ancient history. And to me, that doesn't write his resume, Chad. I'm never going to remember Sean Payton for Bounty Gate. I'm going to remember him for being one of the best coaches of this generation. What's the old saying? If you ain't cheating, you ain't, you ain't trying. trying. Right, Scott? So, hey, that's I'm not making light of it. Listen, it's, you know, in a perfect world, sportsmanship, all that you want, especially after what the Broncos went through uh, with Josh McDaniels and that cheating scandal. And But you know what? The ultimate sting of that and the shame Broncos fans felt, I think, Zach, would have been uh, significantly mitigated if we were talking about a Josh McDaniels head coaching regime that was winning divisions and winning playoff games it would be like, oh, really? That sucked? That happened? Well, oh, that sucks. But anyway, so who are we playing in the playoffs this year? Like, gone, dude. It's gone. Patriots fans are not crying themselves to sleep over those things. They're they're uh, sleeping tight, right, in their sheets because they see how many trophies are in the case. That's really what it comes down to. And that's not to make light of it, okay? I don't want you guys to think that we're sitting here saying condoning cheating. But it, what does it mean when a, when a, when a coach or a staff gets busted, let's just say, in such a scenario, they're they're freaking going above and beyond, right? They're going beyond the pale to win. So just keep that in perspective. But um, okay, let's. Uh, where are we at? We're at thirty nine minutes coming up on. Let me take a quick spin here through the chat. Um, Zach, what are what are your thoughts on? Let's just for a second pretend. All right, assume it doesn't go swimmingly or another team manages to get their hooks in Peyton and Broncos don't even get a chance. Maybe Houston fit, finds out a, finds a way to, to get him to say yes before Broncos get a chance to sit down with him. Uh, is, is Dan Quinn your next guy? 
I guess. <laughs> you know, I, I really was Jim Harbaugh, Sean Payton, or bust, and now one's out of the running and the other one has competition. So I'm going to have to acclimate, acclimate myself to a possible plan B. I guess Dan Quinn, he would be the safe, quote-unquote, high floor choice for the Broncos that would at least return them to competency and respectability. But again, when you're talking about going from Sean Payton to maybe Brian Schottenheimer or Daryl Bevel as your OC, it's a fall. Uh, it's a far fall off that cliff. So I guess Dan Quinn only because of the Russ factor, the Payton factor, and he's the natural leader, the experienced leader the Broncos want. I still think he could bring a nice – revolution to Denver's culture in a positive way. And uh, again, it's like if you could see a, what what the competency of a Jerry Rosberg was able to do to lift this team in two short weeks, a guy like Quinn, man, I think that could be more than just two weeks. It could be a lasting impression or impact on this team. That would probably be right now, Mike, with, with Harbaugh off the board, Quinn is the, the consolation prize if you can't get Peyton, followed by a massive intrigue I have in D'Amico Ryan's, but the problem is traumatized by all these first time head coach swing and a miss, right? Like I want someone who's been down the path and even if they failed, it's okay. You know, people who succeed at anything, I don't care if it's figuring out, learning how to play guitar, becoming a great shooter in basketball, golf, swing, business, education, whatever you have to fail multiple times before you ever really achieve that ultimate success because that's how you learn. You know, that's the difference when it comes to what wisdom is, is you you learned the lessons that you needed to learn that those failures taught you and it makes you better. And the next time it comes around, you don't fail in those situations. And so that's why I'm I'm, I'm really leaning again towards let's get a retread this time. Three, three strikes. You're out, Zach, on the first timers. I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just I was watching the uh, the Bucks game. And here's something you have to really like about Dan Quinn. If the Broncos do end up. Uh, hiring him, his defenses are so active and they're always turning the other offense over. They just turn Tom Brady over in the end zone. So you'd be getting everything that the Broncos defense has lacked under Vic Fangio and now with Giro Evero or the takeaways, the act, you know, the, the sacks, the big plays, the game changing plays. He would make a really good Broncos defense that much better. And he's a natural exuberant leader. He's a player's coach, but not, as you said, Chad, afraid to drop the hammer when it has to be dropped. I'm not going to cry any tears if Dan Quinn is the hire, but we all are hoping, I think, for Sean Payton at this point. Most kind of crazy how Brady made the playoffs with an 8-9 and nine record, right? Making the playoffs as the, the division winner of the NFC South. Um, what do you think of that rule? Just real quick for a quick shift of gear here. The rule that automatic division winners automatic berth in the playoffs. Are you down for that rule? Division winners automatic berth in the playoffs? I mean, yeah, if you won the division, you deserve to be rewarded. Uh, I think it was kind of BS, though. I know the situation was a one-time thing, but Cincinnati was faced with the prospect of having a coin flip determined whether they got a, a home field playoff game even after winning their division. But yeah, I'm cool with that. What would you say? Because I agree, if you're you got to have if you're going to have divisions, you got to have some sort of an incentive to winning it. And obviously, the way the NFL is structured, which is pretty perfect, it's as close to perfect as you can get with the number of divisions and the equal number of teams in each one. What would you say though to an idea like this? If you win your division, you go to the playoffs with one exception. If you finish as the division winner and a sub 500 record, that place in the playoffs gets subverted and given to X wildcard team that qualified under X whatever something. Would you be down for that? I, I think if I'm understanding you correctly, I think if you had a if you've made the playoffs as a division winner at eight and nine. And if a wild card team made it at 11 and six, the wild card team should have the home playoff game in the first round. That's how I interpret that. Well, just simply that team, let's say, you know, the 2008 Patriots, I want to say the year Brady had the ACL, uh, Matt, what was his name? Castle, right? Quarterbacking the, the Patriots. He won 10 games. So they went 10 and six and they missed the playoffs. So obviously we're talking two different eras here, but that's not what my point is. My point is, wouldn't they be more deserving of a playoff berth as a couple of games plus 500 team than a team, even if they won their division that finished sub? 
Yeah, my thing is like, show me deserving in the stat sheet. The Broncos yeah. and Broncos fans are deserving of a playoff game or at least a winning record, and it hasn't happened. So I'm of the firm belief I pretty much won't waver. If you win your division, regardless of your record, you deserve to go to the postseason. I agree too, especially if that's how it's going to be structured. If you have divisions, then you got to have a reason for the division other than just who are we playing on the schedule. There has to be an incentive. But anyway, derailing the conversation a little bit on that. So we'll we'll shift back. But we're at 45 minutes, guys, so we got a little bit more time, but we got to get out of here soon. So anything you want us to get to, get it in the chat. Zach, what are the odds of the Denver Broncos blowing everybody's mind? Like if they swing and miss, they just can't get Sean Payton. Is Euro Evero becoming this team's head coach? After just failing with Nathaniel Hackett, who is as green as they come as a head coaching candidate, do you really want to go down that path with – Hackett's buddy in Evero. And not to take anything away from Ajiro, I just don't think he's ready yet with the Broncos, Chad, or another team. I know he's had like four head coaching interviews. I just think he's like a year away from really stepping into that role. A lot like D'Amico Ryans. Ryans was a head coaching candidate last year, but he stayed with San Francisco, and now his stock is even higher. I think if Evero stays in Denver as D.C., this time next offseason, he'll be a shoe in for a head coaching job. Plus, you know what would nag at me? if you were to make a Giro Evero head coach is he turned down the interim job because of his loyalty right. to Nathaniel Hackett. So how far does that loyalty stretch right. into the motivations of the man? Would you really want to tie your, the destiny of your team? I mean, this is the head coach. You can't get wrong. This has to be the fix. This has to be winner, winner, chicken dinner. And I'm not trying to take anything away from a Giro Evero, but that would nag at me like wondering is this dude going to like try and torpedo us because of some vendetta because we fired his best friend on the planet? You know, it's, a, it's just something that would bother me. Yeah, he could be a double agent. Uh, William Gold uh, Goodwin chimes in with a good point here. Uh, I like Evero, but he has one year as a DC. You know who that reminds me of? VJ. VJ. Yeah, he had one year as the Dolphins defensive coordinator before John Elway came calling. I just think the Broncos are too traumatized. There's too much PTSD and bad history with inex inexperienced young coaches that you can't go the Evero route just yet. I hope he sticks for as a DC, though, because the, you could go, well, your argument, Chad, if you keep him as a DC, doesn't that still hold true? Like he could torpedo. Well, it would still, it wouldn't nag at me in the same way because he wouldn't be the ultimate guy like if you detected that in any way shape or form that things were going south because he was purposefully trying to sabotage your team due to some stupid thing this friend well that's okay all right you fire him and it doesn't completely ruin your team you promote the linebackers coach defense coordinator or whatever two different things now i want to be clear though i'm not saying that that is the case with the zero ever i'm just telling you it's something that i would be thinking about if i were hiring him like because he turned that's well, that was purportedly Zach. His excuse for turning down interim was out of loyalty and solidarity to his friend. He's not going to accept that. Now, if he would have accepted it, or even if he just wouldn't have, if it was offered to him and he said, No, I'm not going to take it. I want to just focus on defense. And Hackett never came up, wouldn't even come to mind. I wouldn't even be thinking about it. But at the end of the day, give the man credit because his defense did falter down the stretch compared to the first half of the season. But it didn't seem to me that when Hackett was fired, Evero's defense gave up the ghost. Like they lost one game, uh, had a bad first half in another, but like they, they were intense. They they didn't give up, uh, which tells me, of course, the coordinator didn't give up. There's a natural regression to the mean. It was always improbable for Evero to keep up a top five unit in his first year, considering the injuries that mounted, considering they were on the field every five minutes because of the offense. The Broncos were still a top 10 defense in DVOA. They were top 15 in most categories. It was a really, really strong first year by Ajiro Evero. And for the most part, Chad, he could not have impressed me more as a DC. All right, guys. Uh, I think we've mined this conversation about as far as we can tonight. Plus, there's a great playoff game going on right now, and we know you guys want to watch it. So we're going to sign off, but we got a few messages for you. Yes, sir. That was the Mile High Huddle podcast. Hope you all had a great evening and day today. If you haven't followed us on Twitter, be sure you're doing so at the MHH pod. Uh, the main account is at Mile High Huddle. Chad's at Chad and Jensen. Myself is at Kelberman NFL and Scott, our producer at Scout Kennedy. If you guys want some merch, you know what it is, where it is, huddleuppod.com and get your merch on. And if you haven't, go to facebook.com slash 
slash mile huddle pod be sure you're liking that page and following that page if you haven't go to apple Podcasts and leave your football priest a five-star review for a chance to win some of that merch each and every month but please 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 guys and gals subscribe like and share this video and every video you see on the mhh channel it really helps us grow and reach more broncos fans just like you amen amen shout out to these great super chat superstars tonight david McElrath. Sam Bam, Naj, Michaela Israel, Deanna Hendry, much love and respect. And then also on Facebook, our great supporters, Michael Ronquillo, Throwing Down, Phil McLaughlin, Howie Freaking Day, and George Fox. Love it. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate each and every one of you who are tuning in live or listening after the fact as an on-demand podcast. We love you. We appreciate you. Buckle up Tuesday, Zach, as is kind of our uh, woe is me thing, right? Like tomorrow could be a huge news day. So make sure you're tuned in to Broncos for breakfast. Make sure you're tuned into building the Broncos tomorrow night because Tuesday could be a very, very uh, tent pole type, type of day. But we'll see how it shakes out. We'll be back Thursday night, though. We're back on Thursday night, and we should have a lot more to sink our teeth into in relative to the Broncos coaching search. But have a great start to your week, guys. A great end to your Monday. Take care, and as always, go Broncos.